Thank you very much. You can read the book. I don't think you have to do your schoolwork. That's, <laughs> that sounds fine. Just assign the book, and then it'll be even easier. Um, hi, I'm Jonathan Katz. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. It is wonderful to be here in Arkansas uh, and at this fine institution. Um, I actually had the privilege and the opportunity to get to know the man whose name and picture are all over the place here in a very cursory, sort of three feet away sort of way um, while I was the Associated Press correspondent in Haiti. Um, President Clinton was coming down a lot, uh, especially starting in, well, I guess starting in 2009 uh, when he was named the United Nations Special Envoy for Haiti. Uh, and as the Associated Press correspondent, I was usually the one who was tasked with uh, tagging along. And so we can talk about some more of that uh, as we get going here. But um, obviously, I want to talk about the earthquake. I want to talk about Haiti. I want to talk about how things are now. And I look very much forward to the uh, conversation that I hope will ensue. This topic usually inspires uh, a lot of passionate questions and answers from the audience as well. So um, I'm really looking forward to a good give and take. Um, it's been just over three years since a 7.0 earthquake devastated southern Haiti, uh, and in particular its capital, which was the center of its political, social, and economic life to far too great extent, as we should talk about in a little bit. Now, as you heard uh, in the introduction, um, I was in my house when the earthquake struck in the hills above Port-au-Prince uh, in the suburb called Petionville, the Associated Press House. Um, I was up on the second floor uh, taking a little break from work. Not a whole lot was going on anyway, but the next day we were planning on flying up to the north and uh, doing a, some reporting actually about orphanages there. The earthquake obviously took all of us by surprise, but in retrospect, we probably should have seen it or something like it coming. In November of 2008, just behind my house, across the ravine, a school called Collège La Promesse Evangelique collapsed, taking 100 lives with it. Most of those were the students. It actually fell on a Friday morning during a class party. Um, also some teachers and uh, some other adults who had been on hand. And at that time, the mayor of Port-au-Prince warned that 60% of the buildings in the city were in a dangerous condition and probably needed to be raised. This itself came on the heels of the four storms and uh, hurricanes that had actually inspired the appointment of President Clinton as UN Special Envoy for Haiti, devastated the country, wiped out a substantial portion of the economy, claimed about 800 lives on their own, uh, including flooding the city of Gonaive in northwest Haiti, up to the roof lines for the second time in four years. It was very clear that Haiti as a country and Port-au-Prince as a city were not ready for a major disaster, that the government did not have the resources on hand to respond to a disaster if one struck. An earthquake itself probably would have been a little hard to predict. You'd have to look back in history. Uh, the city was actually founded in 1749, and it was struck twice by earthquakes that destroyed the city in, in its infancy. But both of those came before the ancestors of most Haitians were even brought to the island. Uh, most of them, obviously, uh, kidnapped, brought in, in shackles as part of the slave trade. And before they then rose up and claimed their freedom, ultimately, in 1804. So that memory had been broken. There had been earthquakes subsequently. There had been some shakes in the Dominican Republic. Uh, but there hadn't been a memory of earthquakes specifically in the capital. But nonetheless, it was very clear that there was extreme vulnerability. And in the time before the earthquake, between especially the, uh, the, those storms that struck in 2008, along with the, uh, another similar storm that struck in 2004 and caused significant flooding then, there was a lot of time in which serious investment and planning could have been done in order to prepare Haiti to manage its own affairs and to look out for its own people. And that work wasn't done. And the sad legacy of the earthquake now, three years later, if we're honest with ourselves and we really look at what's gone on, is that that work could have been done in the last three years as well, or at least begun in a significant way. And I would argue that it hasn't been. Now, I know that there are probably some people in this room that disagree with that assessment, and I look forward to hearing from them. But 
that's essentially the situation. So here's how this is. Um, I've gone around a little bit since I've written the book, um, and I've had an opportunity to talk to lots of different kinds of audiences in lots of different places. And I find that basically there are kind of three levels at which I can approach the question of what went wrong. And it sort of depends on the engagement of the audience and the knowledge of the audience. And I happen to know that given the prestige of this institution and, and the experience of so many people in this room who have either been in Haiti or worked in Haiti or going to Haiti or have been in contexts that are similar enough, uh, I know that we're, we need to be talking at a pretty high level here. But if you'll indulge me for a second, we'll go to the low level first. Um, the low level answer, the basic entry level, here's the answer to the big question that everybody has, is foreign aid doesn't work the way that you think it does. Again, I understand, I'm not talking to you guys, I'm just I'm generalizing here, but that's the answer that I usually give. So that's where it begins. Foreign aid doesn't work the way that you think it does. Most people who wanna hear more about what's going on in Haiti or wanna ask me questions about the book, what they basically wanna know is where did the money go? There was all this money, it got spent in the aftermath of this disaster, things didn't get better, so where did it go? Did somebody steal the money? Was the money spent really stupidly? What happened? And the answer is, foreign aid doesn't work the way that they think it does. Foreign aid doesn't operate in the sense of a rich country taking a big pot of money and walking over and handing it to a poor country. And then the poor country takes it and either they make something with it or they don't. And if you don't see the things that this money was supposed to buy on the ground, then it probably meant that somebody stole it. The government, somebody, corrupt along the way. It doesn't work that way. It hasn't worked that way for a very long time and in many ways it's never worked that way. If you look at the money that was spent in the wake of the earthquake, look at the humanitarian relief figure for instance, 2.43 billion dollars. 93 percent of that was spent in the donor countries themselves. It was spent on non-governmental or organizations, NGOs that are based in the countries themselves, one of which has an office in the building. It was spent on the International Red Cross movement. It was spent on things like jet fuel to fly down the planes. It was spent to pay the pilots to fly down the planes. It was spent to fix the rotor blades on the helicopters. It was paid a million dollars a day for the USS Carl Vinson nuclear-powered aircraft carrier uh, that was in the Bay of Port-au-Prince for 18 days. That's real money, it adds up. And when you say, well, all of that money was spent, so why hasn't everything gotten better? It's because the money isn't necessarily spent on the things that are gonna create the long-term solutions. Again, I understand this is really basic, just stick with me for a second. The thing is that you want, when you see a country like Haiti and you see devastation like we saw on January 12th of 2010, for the global picture to improve. You want for people to have better homes, you want them to have better schools, you want them to have clean drinking water that isn't going to kill them. You want them to have strong institutions on hand that are able to respond to disasters on their own. Well, buying jet fuel and bringing down bags of rice isn't going to create those institutions. This is obvious, it's very simple if you think about it, and I know that, some, that a lot of you have, have worked in this area and so you know it firsthand. But a lot of people don't know that. And in fact, even in Haiti, a lot of the people don't know that. When you're dealing with people who are living their day-to-day -day lives in the quake zone, they heard about all the money too. They heard about six milliards de dollars, six billion dollars that had been promised at the donors conference. And they saw Bill Clinton, sometimes in person, coming down and walking around. And they heard the president of the country then and the president of the country now talking about all of these promises have been made in the international community and they don't see the results. And so they also assume that, well, this money must have come down and it was supposed to buy a better school and it didn't, it must have been stolen. And when these things don't get better, it perpetuates this cycle and it perpetuates the cycle of distrust. And very often, their own government is the one that gets the blame. And then you come around again and you say, well, we're going to do these things, we're gonna to try to improve your life and we have to move the money through these state institutions. And people say, no, 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 we don't want that. They steal all of it. But many times, it's because they have this image as well that all of this gets promised, and when they don't see results on the ground, it's because it doesn't get delivered. So that's the basic level, is the foreign aid doesn't work the way that you think it does. So the next level up 
is to talk about, to attack a little bit of the perception that we have about foreign aid and what foreign aid and development mean. And that is that, first of all, good intentions aren't enough. That it doesn't just matter that everybody sort of has the same basic core humanitarian principle that they're trying to use to approach a situation. Because if the results aren't there, if they're not actually pragmatically working in a way that improves people's lives in a very functional level, it doesn't really matter what they had intended to do in the first place. To use a really gross example, the United Nations did not intend to give cholera to Haiti. I don't think anybody's actually made that argument that, this that there was an intention there on the part of the UN peacekeepers. Somebody was sitting in a drawing room at Turtle Bay in New York and they said, oh, you know what, the best thing that we could do for this country would be to give them a horrible gastric disease that's going to kill 8,000 people and sicken more than 600,000. I don't think that was the intent. But it happened. So in that case, good intentions weren't enough. And the fact that it happens now needs to be reckoned with. And the fact that the United Nations doesn't want to accept accountability for what happened is a problem. And it doesn't really matter if their intentions are that they think that skipping accountability is going to somehow improve things in the long run because it'll allow them to keep plying their good intentions and combining all the good intentions of the people in their offices and their agencies and the departments to continue to be able to work to create these solutions because whatever the intentions were, the effects have been bad and those need to be reconciled. Those need to be reckoned with. And a lot of people understand this at a lot of different levels uh, who are working on the ground because this stuff ends up being pretty patent. You see it yourself. You see a lot of really dedicated people who really want to spend their lives making good and making a difference and they come down and they run into all these brick walls and all these pitfalls and all these traps and they, they find themselves not being able to execute the programs the way they wanted to or more often than not finding out that the program would seem like it was a great idea on paper before they came down actually turned out to be a horrible idea in practice. And all of those intentions and whatever they are can combine with, by the way, other people who don't have the best intentions. Because there were a lot of people who saw the earthquake in various places and they were contractors or they ran companies of one kind or another and they were thinking, well, this would be a good opportunity to make money or this is a good opportunity to advance my career through this or that. And so there's a combination of all these different things and they come together and they can really create results that no matter what many of the intentions were in the first place aren't the results that you end up getting on the ground. So one person who got this said, you can't forget there are people listening when you say you're going to do things. And I try not to overpromise. Mostly, I think people who have been worked over and messed around with, they kind of get it. Now, I also believe they could withdraw their support if they, don't feel I, if they feel I don't do anything. I wake up every day sick at heart that we aren't doing more. Haitians have the incentive. They need organizational structure and the support to get things done. That's what I'm trying to do, move things along. I want them to consider all their big alternatives. I want them to consider, well, anyway, it goes from there. You can imagine who's speaking there. President Clinton gets this. If you talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, or you look at the way that he's operating when he's on the ground, wearing his many, 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 many different hats in Haiti, it's clear that there is this connection between the, the reality that he sees on the ground and what he's trying to do from a planning standpoint. And so that's why this is kind of at this middle level, because a lot of people, many people who don't have the intellectual prowess of the former president, and just people in general, understand this at a very basic level. But it's also something that's important to consider, is the complexity of the situation, is the history involved in the situation, the fact that no matter how good the idea is today and how good the intentions are today, that they're not coming onto a blank slate. They're coming to a place that, in the case of Haiti, has had a very complicated history with his neighbors, you know, a country that has had far too many of its presidents at one point or another departing the country aboard a U.S. plane, um, that has had, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, historical tumult and had to deal with embargoes and exclusion and all kinds of difficult relationships that were not positive or were not necessarily positively construed. Or in the case of the embargo that was imposed on, on Haiti during the years of the junta in the early 1990s, had a far more detrimental effect on regular people who were living their everyday lives than it was originally intended to, which is something, by the way, that President Clinton cops do quite regularly. Um, and so that's important to understand. But what I'm trying to do by taking advantage of the fact that we're here and we're all on the ball people 
who know this stuff, is I'm, I just want to take it to the next step up from there. Because the next step up from there is the really complicated one, and it's the one where this thing is going to have to be solved. And it's actually the one where I basically almost run out of answers myself, and I revert back to my basic form, which is as a journalist. And all I can really do is ask this question. And the question is, what do we want? What are we trying to do? And what are the results that we're trying to see? What kind of world are we actually living in? And what kind of world do we want to be living in? And I really don't know the answer to that question. But that's one of the things that I think we need to confront here and we really need to think about. Because in Haiti, when the earthquake struck, it was famously, as Paul Farmer refers to it, an acute on chronic event. It was a absolutely unimaginable, I, I, it's, this may sound like an ironic thing for somebody who just tried to write a book about this to say, but undescribable event, undescribable tragedy. Because it, it, it hit at a level, it, it, it destroyed everything. It, it, it killed so many people, but it also destroyed the landmarks and all of the institutions and the touchstones. And even for a country that had gone through disaster before and a country that had gone through hardship before, to wake up and know that the National Palace was gone and the Parliament was gone and the, the, uh, the equivalent of the Supreme Court had crumbled into a bunch of jigsaw puzzle pieces. It, it changed everything. It was, it was a, a disaster that still, three years later, having lived through it myself, is almost impossible to imagine. And people approached this, and we were trying to figure out, all of us, everybody who was there, what can be made from this? What are we going to build out of this? And of course, the famous phrase that the former president used and had actually been using for some years by that point was to build back better. Another phrase that was brought up at the donors' conference was to build differently. Well, what does it mean? What do we want when we say that something needs to be built back better? One of the issues that came up in Haiti in the wake of the earthquake was that the plan for the reconstruction was very much tied to a specific economic model and a specific vision of how the world functions and how Haiti ought to function as part of the world. And that economic model was spelled out to a large extent in a report that was written by uh, the economist Paul Collier uh, that was released in January of 2009. And it was very much the vision that President Clinton, as the UN Special Envoy, was there to see fulfilled. And that vision basically stated is that Haiti should become a more integral part of the world economy. And what it means is, essentially, serious investment should be made in, for instance, uh, factories producing garments for export to the United States. And this created all kinds of questions because one of the main fundamentals that Professor Collier said in his report was necessary for this industry to function, which everybody knows if you've worked in the garment industry, is that the workers have to be paid a fairly low wage. That Haiti's advantage, the one thing that Haiti could bring to this was, besides proximity to the United States to save on shipping costs, was the fact that people were willing to work very cheaply. And at the time that his report was written, the minimum wage in the country came out to about $1.75 a day, which even in Haiti doesn't get you very far. This is known. Now, there have been efforts made to raise the minimum wage. Actually, the minimum wage is, is uh, somewhat higher now than it was then. But this vision is continuing. And it's not that garment factories are the only thing that the Reconstruction has to show for itself. But it has, I think, inarguably been the main thrust of the Reconstruction. When you look at the way the money has been spent from the United States State Department, when you look at the things that have been invested in, when you look at the things that can actually be pointed to in the one year, the two year, the three year after action reports saying this is where the money went, a lot of attention is put on, for instance, Caracol, which is a garment uh, an industrial park, but this primarily focused on the uh, export of garments in the north of Haiti. And there are a lot of other ways in which this vision of Haiti as a place that's going to produce stuff fits in. So even when you're talking about agriculture, which again is universally understood to be a major need in Haiti, it is at this point among people paying attention 
pretty much universally understood that the food policy in Haiti, going back to the 1980s, has been absolutely destructive. That the importation of heavily subsidized U.S. food, much of it actually rice produced right here in the state of Arkansas, uh, has come into Haiti and undercut Haitian farms and destroyed people's ability to grow a crop. This is something that, again, President Clinton took personal responsibility for, actually, in March of 2010. In testimony to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, he said, it may have been good for, my far for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it was a, a disaster for the people in Haiti. This is known, but when you look at the actual ideas that are pushed forward and the way that investment is done in trying to move Haitian agriculture back from this moribund state, it's often focused very much on how can this fit into this larger global economy? How can we, for instance, produce large numbers of mangoes and get mango processing plants and get roads to the ports and then export the mangoes? It's a vision, and I don't necessarily, I don't know if it's the right vision or the wrong vision, but I know what the track record of that kind of work has been. And this is what I mean when I say we have to confront what kind of world are we living in and what kind of world do we want to live in. So Haiti has tried the garment factory thing before. Uh, in the late 70s and early 1980s, uh, they were known as economic processing zones. They were built mostly in Port-au-Prince, uh, which helped create the circumstance in which people were leaving the countryside at larger and larger rates. They were abandoning farms that couldn't compete with food that was coming in from the outside, and they were moving into the city to try to get work in these factories, which then picked up and left when circumstances weren't as good, when there was more political tumult and when basically they could find somewhere else that was easier to work, cheaper to work, and they could pay people less. And what they left behind essentially was, uh, well, most famously, a neighborhood that when it was built was named for the uh, mother of the former president, Jean-Claude, or president for life, the dictator, Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier. His mother was uh, Simon, City Simon. Uh, when uh, the dictatorship fell, it was uh, renamed City Soleil, the city of the sun. It's the most famous slum shanty town in the country. There is a lot of fear that the same thing is going to happen again in the north. Now, again, I've heard many counter arguments, and some people in this room may have them, that it's going to be done differently this time, and there's going to be more of an effort made to create a permanent garment industry, for instance, uh, with more focus on a slightly higher level manufacturer, such as uh, knit and dye operations, instead of merely uh, uh, sewing t-shirts and, and, and the most menial stuff. But the track record, in general, for the industry hasn't been great. One of the main places that it was compared to in Paul Collier's own report, for instance, was Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a thriving garment industry full of miserable people who uh, have, in recent years, enacted huge protests. And uh, there have been, obviously, in, in, uh, also in recent years, a number of really tragic fires which speak to one of the main dangers of the industry, which is that because the main operating principle is that you just get a bunch of people and pay them as little as possible and try to cut costs every way that you can so that you can send this stuff out and sell it fairly cheaply while still keeping a healthy margin, is that the basic standards that workers need in order to, say, not die in a fire are not always met. And this was true in Haiti as well, and I talk about it a little bit in my book, but if you look at the, the reports from the International Labor Organization about the standards uh, that the garment factories that were already existing in Haiti lived up to, they were missing almost all the major categories that they needed to hit. This is how the world is. Now, when we come into Haiti from the outside and we're trying to improve people's situation, and we say, well, we understand that there's massive unemployment, and we understand that people need jobs, and we understand that there's sort of these analogs to our own situation where there's unemployment and people need jobs, and we're going to try to do some of the things there that work here, and we're going to try to fit them into these industries that will kind of communicate with one another from one place to another. Oftentimes, we sort of miss what's really going on on the ground, I would say, when we come in to intervene. And this is one of the things that I talk about a little bit in the book, for instance, the idea of massive unemployment in Haiti is actually really confusing when you stop to look at it. Because if you've ever spent time in Port-au-Prince, 
you're ever out on the street, you'll notice that most of the time, it seems like nearly everybody that you see is engaged in some form of activity or another. It's a really busy place. Now, I talk in the book about, for instance, a radio report in which a reporter uh, saw people on the street hawking their wares and trying to flag down cars and sell bottles of juice and wash the car windows in exchange for you know, a couple of coins. And the way that radio reporter saw it was basically as this you know, almost like a, a feverish panic in which people had absolutely nothing and were just trying to get scraps of whatever they could. But if you really think about it, what that reporter was seeing was people making a living. And it's called this in Creole, it's called uh, Cheche la Vie. And the people that he saw were actually, in most instances, parts of long supply chains, complicated supply chains, in which they were buying things on credit. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're the guy who gets your juice, you're waking up in the morning and you're going and you're buying the juice from a supplier who probably gets it from a supplier in the Dominican Republic who may very well get it from a supplier in the States. And this money's changing hands and there's a really complex economy going down there. And a lot of people that we would otherwise point to and say, you, you're unemployed because you don't have a, what I would normally think of as being a job, are actually working. And when we intervene and we try to create a new industry or we try to create something that is what looks to us like uh, economic progress, we actually may be interfering with an economy that is actually there on the ground and functioning. Now, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that everybody should get a juice box and go out on the street and sell juice, because clearly that's not feeding families either. But the problem there isn't a job. The problem there is income. The problem there is actually paying people enough and giving them enough security that they're able to actually count on the money, use the money on their families, create investments. There's obviously lots of other things as well. You need for there to be things to invest in, and it would be good if all the money that people are spending on school tuition, for instance, was actually going to decent schools with teachers who had completed the ninth grade themselves. And these things are very complicated. And I'm not, absolutely not here to tell you that these things are simple, and if we would just fix it, everything would get better. But what I'm saying is that we need to consider how these contexts really are, how the world really is, how things are really functioning. And then try to look at that and say, well, what do we want to make of this? And what kind of role do we want to play in it? Um, I'm just going to take you right back to the idea of foreign aid and the difference in the way that it works versus the way that we often imagine it. Because one of the other purposes of foreign aid often is just to sort of make us feel good about ourselves. And it's legitimate because it can help people and helping other people should make you feel good about yourself because that's a good thing to do. Thank you. But the problem is that the way that it is done is not the way that we imagine it. Because it's not just this huge generosity of spirit pouring out all this money to other places. It can involve some creative accounting and it can also just sort of involve, well, you know, if it's all the same to you, I'll keep the money myself or I'll give it to my brother or I'll give it to my constituent in my congressional district and I'll have him go down with an NGO and he'll do some work and at the end of the day, he doesn't have to be held accountable to the beneficiaries, he doesn't have to be held accountable to anybody except me and whether I decide to give him more money or not. That's the way the system is. And if that's how we want it to be as a country, I guess that's fine. It's not particularly the way that as somebody who lived in Haiti and cares about the place, that I would like to see it go, but if that's the decision that we want to come to, as long as we can honestly answer the question of how is the world, if our answer is just fine, let's keep doing what we're doing, then that's great. But then we can't ask years after a disaster, why haven't things gotten better? Because we have to acknowledge that we've actually made a choice. So this is basically what it comes down to. These are really complex situations. I could stand up here and talk for six hours, I don't know if I have it or not yet, and not even begin to cover all of the exigencies and difficulties and complexities and just weirdness that you come into when you're trying to work in aid and development, especially in a place that is as complex and sometimes insular and sometimes just completely inscrutable as Haiti. But what I'm trying to say is that we have to start to try to understand. And we have to actually put a premium on trying to figure out what's really going on 
what attitudes we're really carrying in, and what programs we're really trying to execute, and for what ultimate benefit. Are we trying to keep the price of t-shirts low? Are we trying to feed people? Like, what are we doing? We have to look at it, we have to look at what we're doing, we have to look at what the actual effects are, and one of the preferable ways for this to happen would be to have real accountability mechanisms that allow the people who we're supposed to be helping can come back and tell us whether or not we're doing a good job. And just to put in one more push for this, because this has been a really big week for this, for those of you who've been following the ongoing saga of the cholera epidemic in Haiti, the United Nations has just decided as of last Thursday that they're not even going to receive the case that's been presented on behalf of 5,000 of the now more than 8,000 uh, killed by cholera in Haiti. Um, and the basic answer is that they have immunity and they don't want to mess with their immunity and thank you very much for stopping by. That's an example of accountability gone absolutely horribly wrong. We need to have accountability, we need to have a real dialogue, we need to go into these things with our eyes open. But then ultimately, this is what I'm saying, because really ultimately this is, I'm a journalist and I will go and find another story to write about, but the people who are really working on this stuff really need to confront themselves in this situation and really make a call. And the call is, how are things being done right now, really? And is that okay? And once we've answered that question, both those questions, then I think we'll really be getting somewhere. But I want to have a conversation now, so I want to open this up to questions. Yeah, from the let's, floor. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much. That was great. Um, All right, if you would raise your hand if you have questions, and uh, we'll get the microphone to you. Yes, sir, right here. Um, how much of a role do you feel that seismophobia or fear of the next earthquake is impacting some of the issues that you're having? I think it, it um, uh, well, first of all, I don't know if I would call it a phobia because I think it's legitimate. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> that, that's the, the term. No, 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 I understand. No, it's, it's probably good. I was just mad. I, I have seismophobia, I guess, actually. I mean, because I, I spent... Um, uh, two months, basically, after the earthquake. I mean, I was able to get, if, if I had wanted to, actually, the night of the earthquake, the U.S. Embassy wouldn't let me in, although eventually they sort of relented. But after that, basically, I had an option to have a roof over my head and elected to sleep in a tent for two months because it was a lot more comfortable for me. Um, and actually, yesterday, there was a, a 3.5 um, Tembler, I guess you can call it an aftershock that hit, uh, that was felt very clearly in Petionville. Um, and I'm obviously not down there, but my Twitter stream lit up with uh, uh, people remarking, and I think there were probably people who slept outdoors. Um, it was definitely an issue in the immediate aftermath in terms of where people wanted to sleep. Um, there was a definite issue with people, for instance, helping to form what became the camps because they wanted to sleep outside. They preferred to sleep under a tarp than, than under a, a heavy building. Again, I don't know if I would call it a phobia because there were aftershocks that were continuing. A lot of those homes really were destroyed. And man, once you've seen what one of these things can do when it changes its mind about staying up there, you don't want to stand under it. Um, I'm over it now, more or less, but uh, I still kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a crack in that part of it. Um, and, but there were two parts of that as well. Because in addition to people deciding that they wanted to sleep outside in the quake zone, there were 600,000 people estimated who left, who went back to their homes in the countryside. And that's actually one of the great failures, I would argue, of the earthquake response. Um, there was a real failure on the part of the responders. And this was a failure of a lot of things. Part of it was coordination. Part of it was insularity. Um, the, a lot of the responders organized themselves into what was known as the cluster system, where they would divide themselves up by subject area. So you'd have a health cluster and a camp management cluster and a, uh, a water and sanitation cluster, for instance. And they would come together and they would hold meetings on their subject matters, but those meetings were very often held on the United Nations logistics pace, behind walls, concertina wire, turrets, AK-47s, M4s, uh, you know, a guy who asked you for your uh, identification card when you came in, and if, as a Haitian, you were actually able to get through all of that and end up in the meeting, you would then probably have absolutely no idea what was going on because the meetings were conducted almost entirely in English. 
There was constant turnover of the staffs, and again, there was a complete lack of coordination. So there wasn't really anybody out there, or at least the very few people who were out there who did understand what was going on in terms of this spontaneous decongestion of the capital weren't able to share it with everybody else. And an opportunity was really lost. Because whereas somebody could have come up with a intelligent way to disperse aid or uh, dispense aid to uh, other parts of the country, um, one of the main issues, for instance, was that people were leaving Port-au-Prince. They were going back to places in the countryside that they had moved from, mostly for economic reasons. They were going back, and lo and behold, the economy hadn't gotten any better since when they left, and their family didn't have any extra food to feed them. So it would have, in many ways, been more useful insofar as food aid was needed, which food aid was definitely needed to what extent, nobody really knew because proper surveying wasn't done. But regardless, to the extent that food aid was needed, it probably would have been even more useful out there because if you could get people who had left the capital to stay instead of moving back, as I had mentioned before, there were far, Haiti was far too centralized. It was, Port-au-Prince is far too important to an economic, a social, and a political center. You had, the estimates are, somewhere close to 3 million people living in a city that was built, depending on who you ask, for between 50,000 and 250,000. And for generations, there had been this dream that people would move out. And then all of a sudden, after the earthquake, because of seismophobia, essentially, 600,000 people do it, and the responders miss it. And they move back. And they move back into the camps, because who wants to sleep under a roof? So I think that it was important, but I think that it was only one of a host of factors. I think that. At this point, it has probably mostly dissipated. Um, you know, as humans, we're, we're pretty resilient, uh, and part of that is that we forget things pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are not staring at their ceilings the way that they would have in the immediate aftermath of the quake. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing because the, most of the homes, especially the ones that they moved back to, are in no better condition today than they were then. So maybe in that case, a little more seismophobia would be advisable. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the fact that people didn't want to sleep indoors, that was a major feature of post-quake Haiti, um, but uh, it, was, it was part of a huge mix. I have a question in the very back. Yes, ma'am, back to the very back row. Hi, I'm Tiffany Newburn. Hi. Um, one of the questions that I want to ask, do you think what the U.S. government was, was doing was ethical, ethical, I'm sorry, in handling the situation with their assistance? And explain, please. Um, it's a very good question. It's a, I mean, even when you're talking about one particular country, especially in the case of the United States, because it's such a big and wealthy and powerful country, it can be a little hard to generalize about the entire government as a whole because you had all kinds of different parts that were doing all kinds of different things at different times. Insofar as the push from the U.S. government over the three-year horizon, over the long term, has been to focus on these means of economic growth that uh, benefit us as Americans. I don't know if I would call it necessarily unethical, but it's definitely something that has to be considered carefully. Is that a good way to put it? In 2011, um, the former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, uh, gave a speech at the Economic Club of New York in which she talked about a vision of economic statecraft, in which it was important to consider foreign policy in terms of this isn't the phrase that she used, but it's often referred to in aid circles as return on investment. Um, this is a really popular thing in aid and development these days. And I understand completely the context in which she was discussing it because the debate in this country tends to be between should we just have absolutely no foreign aid whatsoever or should we keep doing things the way that we've done them up till now. There isn't much of a debate among the public at large about really having fundamental reform and, and totally changing our processes. Now, within the State Department, within USAID, there is an increasing desire on the part of a number of people, including Raj Shah, the head of USAID, um, and I think that uh, a number of the people in, in Secretary Clinton's office, including her, talked often about the importance of moving money through 
country institutions, um, the importance of trying to find ways to do direct budget support, despite the fact that Congress absolutely doesn't want to have any part of that. Um, and so within the context of that debate, I understand why you would talk about return on investment or economic statecraft or say as USAID did on a recent uh, FAQ that they put out online that one of the top things that they do is create jobs for Americans. Um, I get that. Uh, I get even what uh, the Minister of International Cooperation of Canada, Julian Fantino, was saying uh, when he was expressing his exasperation that Haiti had not produced the results that, quote, Canadians had a right to expect. Um, is it ethical? I think that the, I think that, I, I, I think that really it's a question of deciding what our priorities are and then going with those. What's not ethical, if something, if, if I can be in a position to say that something's not ethical, it's making a promise or saying you're going to do one thing and then not doing it. And I, I read the quote from President Clinton before. Uh, he had said it in an interview that he gave with Esquire magazine not very long after the earthquake. I mean, he knew that people were out there expecting things that if he made promises and they weren't fulfilled, that they were going to be mad. Um, that's, it's, it's unethical to say we're going to give $1.15 billion, uh, knowing, first of all, that a significant part of that is debt relief, and also knowing that Congress probably won't approve it, and then not delivering it. On the whole, it's not ethical just because you're not supposed to say something and then not do it. Um, but again, it's not really for me to decide whether the vision of reshaping Haiti's economy into a producer of cheap garments and mangoes and uh, maybe you know a, a, a couple tourist destinations or something like that, if that's ethical or not. It could be ethical if it actually creates a benefit for the people who live in Haiti, if it makes people's lives better. It could be ethical if it actually fulfills promises that are made. Um, but if we go into it knowing in our heart of hearts that it's not actually going to have a significant benefit on the ground, but that it's the best that we can hope for and it's sort of the optimal bottom line for all the stakeholders, as the phrase goes, and we don't include as stakeholders the people who actually live in Haiti themselves, yeah, I would say that we would have a slight problem with our ethics in that case. But beyond that, I don't really want to judge. Yeah, Jim, Jim right here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Great, great information, um, Jim DeVries. I'm just wondering if the Haitians, is there, or is there a subsection of the Haitian population that have a vision other than you, you, you explained Collier's vision, which has seemed to have bought, you know, it's sort of the world the standard approach. Right. Well, is there an alternative, or is there really a Haitian kind of vision for the future, what would they would like? Well, the first problem in answering that question is that there aren't really mechanisms by which the Haitian people can be heard as a voice. Now, obviously, there isn't. That is the problem. There isn't one opinion, but there also really isn't a forum in which, as they said, this is the problem, there isn't really a forum in which people can express what they want. Now that said, um, there are various views in Haiti of how things could be improved, either on a macro or a micro level. I mean, a lot of people, when you're waking up every day and you don't know if that day you're going to have enough food to feed yourself and your kids, it's a little hard to have a big economic program in mind. Um, and that's really important because so many people in the country are dealing with that kind of life on a day-to-day -day basis. But there are things that can be gleaned from conversations and from taking examples from other places and coming down and saying, well, how are things really and what do you think this would do and what do you think this would do and what do you think this would do? I mean, farmers would like to grow more and they would like to be able to sell more of their things. They would like not to be pushed off of their farm. Um, that's one economic vision. Uh, you know, after the earthquake, there was at a ministerial level in Haiti a proposal that was put together. Um, Oh, now I'm actually blanking if it was after the earthquake or before the earthquake. I think it was, I think it was after. I think it was in advance of the donors' conference um, when they were putting, at the same time that the uh, post-disaster needs assessment was being put together. Um, the prime minister, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting if it was before or after the quake. But there, there, there was a report that was put together with a vision for an economic program for Haiti. You know what, I think it was during the donors' conference in 2009. I think that's why it's mixed up in my head. And that had a much bigger focus on agriculture it had a you know and, and domestic agriculture building up a, a national 
food production system. Um, and it had a, a much bigger focus on construction and infrastructure um, and a, less of a focus on what can we do to get the export sector up to speed really quickly. Um, but again, I wouldn't presume to call that the Haitian vision because I don't think there's one Haitian vision and this is, as, as, as they're saying, um, this is one of the core problems is that it is very difficult for m the vast majority of people in Haiti to be heard at all. Um, you know, there are sort of famous instances uh, after the earthquake. Um, the International Organization for Migration uh, tried an experiment of putting these suggestion boxes um, in, uh, in one of the tent camps. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people who lived in the camp, I think, laughed at it. Some people said, well, okay, I'll give it a shot. And people were writing down all kinds of things, and a lot of them were just really specific needs. They were like, look, this is what I need to stay alive this month. Can you get this to me? Um, and then they, those weren't really answered, and so, you know, people lost their faith in that. And again, as I was talking about at the beginning, the, the, the concept that, you know, like aid travels in this way where it's just like a big pot of money going from a rich country to a poor country, and if you don't get results on the ground, it's because somebody stole the money in between, destroys faith in institutions, destroys faith in government, makes people not even want to speak. Um, but uh, but I, I think that, I think you're asking the right question, and I just think that somebody, I think that the Haitian people en masse need a way to be able to answer it better, and not just have it be one suggestion that's sort of taken under advisement, but really put out in, in, in a basically, you know, a plebiscite um, to the greatest extent possible. I understand that you can't have everybody voting on every little single thing that happens, you know, while, while you're trying to execute a big plan, but just in, at least in terms of the general thrust, hey, what does everybody want? And if everybody says we want garment factories, and it's a f fair election, and, and we've really heard this, and, and, and we can really say with as much confidence as we can say in this country, this seems to be what people want, then okay, go for it. I'm not going to stand in the way. But, but that's the issue, is that we don't know. Right back here. Hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm a first year student. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for writing this book. Um, I just think it's incredibly important. Okay. Um, so my question is, I, I'm going to fudge the fact, but in the book you mentioned that nearly half of U.S. citizens gave to the Haiti relief effort, right? There was a, there was a poll that said that, yeah. Right. So that to me is, is fascinating and it's heartbreaking because it means that we have the capacity for this global empathy and this, this global community and we can engage in that. And then as Dean Rutherford just mentioned, three years later, financial, uh, international financial aid is the first thing that we think we could do away with. So from a journalism standpoint, do you really think that we make a practice more of engaging in spectacle and you know this disaster bleeds that leads kind of thing and that's where we get our responses from or kind of after the quick I was fascinated by trying to understand you know as someone who follows problems in the world how can we harness this again how can we harness this empathy in a, in a more regularized way do you think that's possible or do you really think that that was driven from this ep these you know these epic scenes of disaster and spectacle and in that sense, or do you think that there's ways to engage us in a really regularized way that, that shows that we can be global partners in helping each other out of more, less sexy, you know, more systemic structural problems? Right. And I think that's a really good question. Um, so part of the issue is that there are at least two kinds of work that need to go on here. In terms of the engagement of 53% of the American population, which is what it was a Fox News poll from March of 2010 that reported that basically half of American voters actually had donated something to um, uh, earthquake relief in Haiti. I mean, if you're really talking about getting that kind of a percentage of the population involved, it's going to have to be something spectacular. I don't know if it, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be a disaster, or I don't know what it is, and I don't know, know if it necessarily needs to be a spun a, a certain way in the press, but it certainly has to be something that's going to get people's attention. Because, um, I mean, these days you can barely get people to watch the Oscars, so trying to get everybody to focus on a single need somewhere overseas is going to be very difficult. It can happen, but 
trying to organize a major national conversation like that is going to be difficult and often takes something that's completely out of our control. It often takes something like the earthquake that's just totally spectacular happening. But there are a lot of parts about what, what actually needs to get done on the ground that are decidedly unsexy. And that's one of the issues here, and it's one of the things that's often lost. Because people will sometimes ask, as, as, as uh, somewhat here, you know, for me as a journalist, you know, how can I, how can you keep attention on something for a long time? Uh, because there's always going to be something else that comes along and the media is going to go running after that. And my answer to that is you can't change that. That's what's going to happen. That's, it, it's really essential human nature. I mean, you know, I think going all the way back to when we were Cro-Magnon and living in front of a cave and something really interesting happened over in that cave, everybody went over there, right? And there's not much that you can do to, to change that, and I don't even know that you necessarily want to or need to because, you know, if everybody was still focused, for instance, only on the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004, and then when the earthquake hit in 2010, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, I know, but we're still on the tsunami, I don't think that would have been good either. Um, but there, the good news is you don't need every single person you don't need 53% of Americans. You probably don't even need 10% of Americans to be fully engaged on this issue. You just need the right people to be engaged in the right way. And much more important even than getting Americans engaged or, or the French or, or the Brits or Japanese or whatever is making sure that institutions are developed over the long term that are actually able to handle the really banal, unsexy, boring stuff. Because the big thing that's missing in Haiti after the earthquake is after the spasm of excitement, the really unsexy, banal, boring stuff didn't get done. Like finding ways to get electricity and keep the lights on. And again, laying down pipes and sewers and water treatment plants that will make it so that you could have water that you can get out of a tap that won't kill you. That's really, I mean, to, to be the guy who has to deal every day with sitting there and looking at the dials and the admixture of the fluoride and the chlorine, and I don't even know what you put in water. But whatever, if you're that guy and that's your job, then that's a really boring job, but you just have to wake up in the morning, or maybe it's really fascinating to you, and thank God we found you, the one guy for whom this is fascinating to, because you need to sit there, and you need to look at that dial, and you need to make sure that this is happening, and you have to sit there, and you have to lay this out, and you have to find the funding source, and you have to collect the tax revenue, and you have to pave the road, and you have to monitor the road, and you have to get back your TPS reports and go over them, and it's, that's, really boring, and it's not the kind of stuff that's going to get, you know, major play in the 24-hour news cycle on CNN, but it's the kind of stuff that you have to do to run a country. And so I think part of the problem is, when we're talking about Haiti, is that we have to divorce ourselves from this idea that this is something for us to get really passionate and engaged about, um, and then it's just sort of, we, we're just going to run on pure adrenaline until the adrenaline runs out. That's fine when there's been an emergency and people need to rush in and we need to do the things that you have to do in the immediate aftermath. But in the long run, these l bigger, harder decisions need to be made to finance institutions and allow these institutions to finance themselves so that they can actually go about the day-to-day -day business of running a country so that the next time that there's a 7.0 earthquake, at the very least, the damage can be contained or minimized. And then again, maybe it won't be as exciting as this one had, but maybe in this case, the excitement was the problem. So, so what I'm saying, you understand. I mean, it's, it's, it's really good to have people engaged and, and, uh, uh, and interested, and I'm glad that so many people were. And I think it is really heartening that so many people wanted to do something, even if they weren't quite sure what to do, and even if what they did ultimately may not have been that helpful. And I think there are ways to harness that when that excitement occurs, but we have to get off this cycle of excitement, no excitement, excitement, no excitement, because some things are really boring, but they're the really important stuff. I know there's a lot more questions, and I wish we could continue this all night, but you have the opportunity to purchase the big truck that went by and to visit with Jonathan as he uh, signs your book. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs>